one to six. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. For he founded it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to an idol or swear by what is false, he will receive blessings from the Lord and vindication from God his Saviour. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek your face, O God of Jacob. The second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 11, beginning at verse 32 which is page 1078 in your church Bibles. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he have opened the eyes of the blind could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a, co a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odour, for he has been there for four days. Then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Lord God, our Father in heaven, we welcome you here this morning to hear our worship. Feel your Holy Spirit, soak up your word. May all we do and say this Sunday morning be a testimony to you, our loving and awesome God. This morning, may we acknowledge our imperfections. May we come before you and hold out our hands to you. Look, Lord. I'm a sinner. May we fall to our knees and ask for forgiveness for all those times we have turned from you and gone our own way. May we acknowledge that at times our earthly minds were taken over by worldly stuff and we put you second, Lord. Forgive us for those times, Lord. We cry out to you now. We are sorry, Lord. Forgive us for our sins. Lord, soon we will begin the time of Advent. The TV is already full of adverts telling us to buy the biggest of everything, the most expensive of everything, 
the sparkliest of everything. The list goes on. But Lord, may we begin now to look at the true meaning of the season that's coming, the true meaning of why we celebrate the birth of your Son, our Saviour, the greatest gift we will ever have, born with nothing in a stable, no cradle, no toys, no clothes. We should learn from that single moment in time over the coming weeks. May we not count down to presents, but may we count down to a boy and a girl and a baby in a manger. Lord, we pray for all those in need of you at this time, those who are ill, those who are mourning, those who are sad for many reasons. And of course, we especially bring to you Karen and Destiny. We thank you for the amazing healing you are doing in Destiny's life. And we thank you for Karen and the woman she is. We pray for all those who are supporting Karen at this time. Lord, some of them you know, and some, some know you and some don't. So at this time, may Karen and Destiny be a testament to your true healing. And through them, may a seed of you have been planted. And in time, may they truly come to know you. And Lord, we also pray this morning for the family of Mercy, who died suddenly. Our thoughts are with her family. We pray for Mason and his continued healing. And of course, dear Gwen, over at Bushmead Court. We pray for our new vicar, Reverend Dr. Glenn, and his wife and family as they prepare to move to Luton. And we pray for their old parish as they begin to look for a new vicar to take Glenn's place. Lord, may you work within them at this time, and may they know how much we at Christchurch are looking forward to welcoming them next year. We thank you for all who have stepped in at Christchurch on a Sunday whilst we await Glenn's arrival, all those who have spoken to us both within Christchurch and from other churches. And this morning I especially bring to mind Chris May, who spoke to us last week. I pray this morning especially for his wife Christine, who is battling breast cancer. Lord, we know you're a healing God, and we ask that you hold Chris, Christine and the family close at this time. May they feel the power of your spirit working in Christine, and may they know that we are holding them close in prayer as well. So Lord, as we prepare to begin another week, I pray that each of us, in our own way, finds time to call on you, whether it by listening to worship music, picking up our Bibles, praying, or just talking to you. We, time, we find time for you at least once each day, that we find time to say, Hi Lord, it's me. Thank you, or help, or Lord, what do I do now? Because we know that you're just waiting for that, waiting for us to call on you. In your Son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, it's a, it's a privilege to invite Paul as he uh, comes to speak to us. I'm going to pray uh, for him. Lord God, thank you for your servant Paul. Thank you for the word you've laid on his heart. I ask you, Lord, to bless him as he blesses us with your word this morning. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Well, today, if you didn't realize it, after last night, Halloween is, of course, All Hallows' Day, or better known as All Saints' Day. Right down the centuries, those, there has been a long tradition of the church remembering and venerating saints. More specifically, and in particular, in the Roman Catholic Church, but also in parts of our own church, there is the tradition of not only remembering their lives, but venerating their relics their bodily remains. Indeed, our own son, Chris, who works as a verger at York Minster, a few years ago had the responsibility of looking after the remains of St. Teresa of Lisieux as she spent a couple of days in the Minster whilst on tour to various places in the UK. Huge crowds descended on the Minster to pray in front of her remains, or at least the silver casket purported to hold her remains. It is difficult to discover just how many saintly relics are preserved, but in Italy alone there are an extraordinary number of bits of anatomy scattered profusely throughout the churches. In fact, something like the miracle of the loaves and fishes seems to have happened, 
for many parts have been multiplied. For example, did you know that there are nine breasts of St. Eulalia throughout Italy, Spain, and Sicily? <laughs> in fact, the multiplication of parts seems to be in direct ratio to the prestige of the saint concerned. St. John the Baptist obviously had at least four heads, for there is still one in France, one in Damascus, one in Rome, and a large part of the fourth is preserved in a gold chalice in St. Chalice in St. Mark's Venice. <coughs> St. John also had many fingers, it would appear, for a whole hand can be found in Venice, whilst a further 28 fingers are in various other parts of Italy. Not forgetting, of course, the three fingers in a museum in France, and another of his hands can be venerated in the cathedral in Siena. Now, if you think that's all a bit far-fetched, don't worry, because you could go to the cathedral in Genoa and venerate the complete cremated remains of his whole body. <laughs> Down the centuries, the church has given a high priority to its saints, and their remains have become articles of veneration. But is that all that all saints is about? I don't think so. I think All Saints Day should be a day when we remember and give thanks for all the unsung heroes of our world, and especially those who have and still live in this parish. The people whose saintly lives, saintly lived lives, are known only to God alone. All known as saints to God, but who are not necessarily officially recognized, and certainly whose remains are not particularly venerated. Yet these people are just as special and precious as the great names we remember in the church, such as St. Mark, St. Luke, St. Paul, or whoever. What is special about a saint? What makes them objects of veneration? Well, I believe saints are people who, through their lives, the way they have lived their lives, are people who have allowed others to have glimpses of God's kingdom and salvation. The theologian Paul Tillich said, Saints are people who have been transparent in their lives, allowing us to see through them the wonderful life of Christ. So saints are people who help to see God, the who help us to see God. And the qualities of sainthood are described in the Bible. And this morning we've just read one such passage that describes the necessary qualities of sainthood. And that's in Psalm 24, verses 1 to 6. Psalm 24 is a kind of liturgy of approach describing the character required in those who would be able to worship in the Lord's sanctuary. It says, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? In other words, what qualities of human nature will be needed to be able to worship God? In answer to that question, the psalmist gives three requirements. Firstly, those who have clean hands and pure hearts. I take that to mean those who are earnestly trying to behave in a right and proper manner. Live simply, do your best for your fellow human beings. Think no evil. And then secondly, the psalmist says, do not lift up your souls to what is false. In the time of writing, this meant worship only our God, not any other. In this day and age, I would not want to add, worship God through his son Jesus, whom we have subsequently encountered. And then thirdly, the psalmist writes, do not swear deceitfully. Clearly that means that we must speak honesty, honestly. To be untruthful in the end leads to catastrophe. I also wonder whether the psalmist was saying in a roundabout way, referring to one of the commandments, do not take the name of the Lord in vain. I'm no purist, but I do get offended by the use of some common language. In particular, I really detest the way that the use of the word God has come into everyday parlance. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. You hear it every time you turn on the telly or indeed having a conversation with others. I believe our God is worthy of far more re respect than that. Sorry, rant over. That is Psalms 24, take on what it means to be a saint. Clean hands and heart, not worshipping false gods, not swearing de deceitfully. The qualities of what makes a saint able to see God were further expanded by Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount. In chapter 5 of his Gospel, Matthew tells us Jesus went up a mountain and from that mountain taught the crowds and indeed his own disciples. Known colloquially as the Beatitudes or the Blesseds, this teaching for the people who first heard it was most radical, if not absurd. 
Remember, Jesus was talking to mainly well-educated, well-to-do Jews. Their understanding of the best way to live life was to get the most out of it. The more money you made, the more powerful you were, the more ruthless you were in business, all showed how much in favor you were with God. At least that is what they believed. And in the midst of this belief, Jesus says the following, Blessed are the poor, blessed are the meek, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure in heart, blessed are the peacemakers, and so on and so on. Jesus was advocating a way of behavior and life that on the face of it was decidedly wimpish. Meekness, humbleness, pureness, hardly the adjectives for describing a strong society, surely. And in many ways, those words seem just as alien, just as inappropriate in describing how many would view our society today. The world of high finance, party political fortunes, international politics seem far removed from meekness, humbleness, and pureness. Although perhaps we saw a glimpse of hope last week when the House of Lords challenged the government to rethink its proposals regarding tax credits. However, I want to say most strongly that the society, the saintly way of life that Jesus promoted in the Beatitudes and the Psalmist in Psalm 24 is not a weak way of life. It is not escapism. For Jesus, this way led to the cross, and it leads his followers to the cross. Time and time again, Christians are led to the cross for their faith. They may not die physically as Jesus did, but they're nailed to the cross of ridicule, the cross of sarcasm, the cross of alienation, and even the cross of indifference, all because of their public witness to a faith in Jesus Christ. So why do they do it? How do people find the strength to stand up to this? Why don't they just shut up and give in to the crowd? Well, they do it. They allow themselves to be crucified, as indeed Jesus allowed himself to be crucified, because they know that life does not end at the cross. Far from it. Life does not end at the cross, but rather it begins at the cross. Beyond the cross is real life, real fulfillment. They know that a world which takes the Beatitudes as a foundation for its laws and constitutions will be a happier, far happier and peaceful place than the world we know at the moment. In today's gospel, we read of two people who were to become saints, the sisters Mary and Martha. They were two very ordinary people from a very small settlement called Bethany. They were ordinary, but were to become saints because of their faith and belief in Jesus. They knew that Jesus had the power to heal and to save. Their brother Lazarus had died, but they knew that if Jesus came, there was hope and their faith in Jesus was proved right. In the Church of England, we may not have quite the same enthusiasm for bits of anatomy alleged to have come from certain saints, but that should not stop us getting excited at and thankful for all those saints who have gone before us, saints who have taken seriously the teachings of Jesus, saints who, by the way they have lived, have given us glimpses of how good life can be, Saints who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ wholeheartedly. And today, All Saints Day, we give thanks for ordinary people who, whilst living what seems to be ordinary lives, have been able to see the hand of God at work and point it out to others. People who have witnessed to Christ regardless of the cost to themselves. People who've never taken life for granted, but rather seen each day as a wonder of creation. People who've not only heard the Beatitudes read, but acted out in their lives the implication of that teaching. So this morning, will you join with me in giving thanks for all the saints from whom their labors rest, but most especially those who've been members of this parish and those whom each one of you has met and known? And will you pray that by his grace, God will give you individually the strength and courage to follow those saints, living each day according to the teachings and examples of his son, and by his grace giving others a chance to glimpse the wonder of a life lived in Christ. Amen.